everybody's ears out. Uh, I believe our kids' song was one verse too long. I think it's starting to drop. So uh, <laughs> Caroline worked in Bible school for the first time this week, and then Valerie turned right around and got her to help her with uh, nursery today. Uh, as she was going back, Will, I said, now you'll see why me and Valerie never had no kids. So I'm sorry. <laughs> she, she got indoctrinated this week. Luke chapter 18. We're going to be on verses 31 through 34. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of those things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Let's pray. Lord, again, we praise you for this time together. For your word as we have it today, Lord, and just pray that the Holy Spirit would work in all of our hearts today that we might be open to what you have for us and that we might be faithful and obedient to it. Pray to Heavenly Father, Lord, again, that uh, uh, these words will be the words that we stand in need of today, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for a closer walk to you, Lord, whether it's instruction, uh, uh, reproof, Lord, we just pray that uh, we would listen and obey. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we finally get through with that section that took us uh, several weeks there that ended up uh, uh, with verse 30, and we move on to the next section of verses here in our study of Luke. Uh, if you can remember way back, uh, we got to Luke 9, 51. That was a transition in our study of Luke. And in Luke 9, 51, it says, And it came to pass... When the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And we said back then, if you were here and remember, that was kind of the transition of moving away from his ministry in Galilee and beginning to move into his ministry into Judea as he made his way to Jerusalem. Now, uh, that's been a while ago. We actually covered chapter 9, verse 51 back in November of 2020. So it's been a while. We actually started Luke in December of 2018. So we've been in Luke now uh, for some time. And we are finally getting to where we were transitioning to. We're getting close to Jerusalem. Uh, after he's been moving in and out of all the villages of Judea and his final ministry there, uh, he is getting close to the cross. Jesus came for the cross. The Bible says that he gave his life a ransom for many. So this cross is not an accident. It's not a surprise. Uh, again, as we get back into the text, the first one, he said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Uh, in the next chapter, over in chapter 19, if you just hold your place and flip over, in verse 11 it says, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. You skip down to verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. Verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it. And then in verse 44, uh, it says, And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave thee in one thief step, uh, stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And verse 45 says, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. So we're here. He is, he's about to be in Jerusalem. The next chapter we get into, uh, he will be there. Now, again, we're beginning the end of Jesus' life. All biblical history has pointed to this. The heart of the Christian faith is in the cross. And everything we reference to is about Jesus Christ and his life. Again, I don't know 
uh, what atheists believe or what people who do not believe in Jesus Christ believe the year is, but the year is 2022 because it's 2022 after his birth. So everything we reference references Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what year. They always say it's the same year we say, but I don't know where they get their numbers from because we know where we get our numbers. And so Jesus is ready to go up to Jerusalem and to give his life. The, the text tells us that he takes the 12 aside, the, the 12 disciples, the 12 original apostles, takes them aside privately and tells them we're going up to Jerusalem. Anytime you reference going to Jerusalem, it was always going up. Remember, Jerusalem was set up on a hill. It was a high city. And from the direction they are coming, it is a straight shot up to get to Jerusalem from Judea. So when it says, he says, we're going up, he really means they're going up. They knew they were going to Jerusalem because of the time of year it was. It's time for the Passover. Being a Jew, they knew it was time for the Passover, and Jews went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So they understood and knew that that's where they were going. It wasn't new to them. What they didn't know is that Jesus was the real Passover lamb and that he was going to be sacrificed for the sins of, of all men. So they kind of knew they were going. They just didn't quite understand what all was about to happen. And, and this text tells us that. There, there are parallel passages found. This, this little section is also found in Matthew 20 and in Mark 10. Uh, Mark asks when he's talking about this that the disciples were amazed and afraid they were afraid, they were in fear because again, they just didn't quite understand all that was going to take place and happen. We know this morning, this is God's plan. It had been his plan since before the foundation of the world. And the text tells us that in that first verse, all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He's going to fulfill prophecy. You know, for the, for the past several months, uh, on most Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, we've been looking at prophecy about the end of the world and prophecy about what's going to happen in the end time. But much more prophecy is in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection than there are verses that deal with the end of the world. And so the Old Testament predicted it, and it gets carried out by a bunch of pagan people, by by the Romans, but it is the primary event in history, and the Old Testament has referred to it constantly, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and Adam and Eve, and the original sin, and God walking in the garden, and finding them, and because of their sin, an innocent animal is killed, and those skins are taken to clothe Adam and Eve, and that starts with a reference and a picture of what's going to happen to Jesus one day. There'll have to be the death of someone innocent to cover and to take care of the sins of man. So all the way back in, in Genesis 3, we get that only a blood sacrifice is acceptable to God. As you move through this, you get Abraham and Isaac. You get Abraham going up to offer his only son, Isaac, to, to God. That's going to somehow, he doesn't understand how, uh, he's going to be, his seed will be as the sands of, 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 of the beach. But yet, somehow, he's going to give up his only son. But when he gets there, we know God gives him a sacrifice and provides a, a way provides an innocent death substitute to take the place of Isaac. Again, a picture of, what, of what's going to come. We get the original Passover that they are about to celebrate here in Luke. The original Passover where the blood of a spotless lamb, spotless, guiltless, innocent, without blemish, if that blood is posted above the door, and if that blood is there, then the death angel will pass over, and that firstborn will not be killed. So we know the Old Testament is full. And I'm just going to give you a few this morning, just real quickly, and then uh, throw you out some without reading them as well. But I'm going to read a couple. The first one's found in Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, in verse 1, and then skipping down to verse 14. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The exact word Jesus will use 
on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 14. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hands and my feet. Complete picture of what's going to happen to Jesus Christ. And then verse 17. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Psalm right there. A picture of what's going to come. And if they had only known their Old Testament scripture, they would understand this. But they didn't get it and they didn't understand it. Isaiah probably has the most messianic prophecy scriptures there are. The most verses about Jesus as the Messiah. We'll read a uh, section that you are familiar with, but Isaiah 53 starting in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from pit prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall. Amen. Again, perfect picture of what's going to happen. Verse 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Again, complete, perfect picture of what is going to happen to Jesus. And Jesus knows this. I mean, he, he wrote the word. He understands it. It's not an accident. It's not something that just happened. Jesus wasn't born and had one plan and then that plan went awry and it all went, went haywire. This has been the plan from before the foundation of the world. The Old Testament and everything in it pointed to it and now it's time for that to be fulfilled and that's what he's telling the twelve. He takes the twelve aside. Now it's time to go up to Jerusalem so that everything that's been written in the Old Testament can come to pass. It can be fulfilled. The, the Messiah is here. He must die and he'll raise again on the third day. Again, the death of Jesus is no accident, but it's complete fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. All the way down to the most minute details. Zechariah 9. And again, I'm going to throw these out. If you want to go back and and watch the video and, and pull it up. Or if you want to see me, I'll give them to you. But Zechariah 9 details to the point how he's going to enter in to Jerusalem, even to the colt that he would be riding. Who his enemies would be, outlined in Psalm 2. The desertion of his disciples that would leave him and not be there, Zechariah 13. The 30 pieces of silver that Judas would betray him over, Zechariah 11. 
The fact that no bones in Jesus would be broken when most of the time, almost all the time they were during the crucifixion. Exodus and Psalms both tell us that. They would cast lots for his clothing. We just read that in Psalm 22. They'll give him vinegar to drink while he's on the cross. Psalm 69. He'll raise again on the third day. Psalm 16. Everything is there in great detail. His birth was prophesied and his death is prophesied and his resurrection is prophesied. It's all there. But why didn't they get it? They didn't know the word. Why don't we get a lot of stuff? Because we don't know the word. We don't know the word like we ought to know the word. The Lord knew exactly what he was going to go through. He knew. He wrote the Old Testament. He knew the road. <coughs> just quickly, remember, when he meets the, the two men on the road to Emmaus, and he just kind of slides up beside them and says, hey, what's going on? And they go, hey, do you, do you not understand what's happened? Jesus has been killed. Oh, who's Jesus? What are you talking about? Oh, man, you don't know about Jesus. But then Jesus begins from the beginning yeah. through the scriptures to quote to them scriptures that dealt with his death, burial, and resurrection. He knew it was coming. He understood it. They just didn't understand it. So getting back to, to the text there in Luke 18, verses 32 and 33, he says this, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated and spit it on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. These two verses, Jesus again tells the twelve that he's taken privately apart and said, hey, we're going up to Jerusalem and these things are about to happen. He's outlining exactly what he's about to go through. We'll get there in a little while. Again, we started Luke in 2018. JT, when he was teaching Bible school this week, the text uh, of the verses he taught on were Luke 23. And JT said, uh, Brother Tom will be there in a few weeks. I thought, well, he's, he's got a lot more, he got a lot, a lot more confidence in me than I do. I don't, I don't think it'll be a few weeks when I get by the time we get Luke 23. Maybe by next Bible school we might be to Luke chapter 23. But we're going to get there. Eventually, if the Lord hadn't come back, amen, hopefully we won't get there. But we'll see this. And we look at these verses and we think, well, you know, this would be perfect verses for Easter. And we hear about this on Easter, but we don't hear about it much more because we don't concentrate on it. That's kind of just an Easter thing. But, you know, we need to be reminded time to time exactly what Jesus went through because of us. Amen. Because it wasn't because of him that he went through it, amen. Yeah. It's because of our sin, our transgression, our failure, our iniquity. Right. As Isaiah said, it was the chastisement of our peace right. that was on him, right. not what he had done. Right. And so he just gives them a little snippet. Hey, I'm going to be delivered up. That word that gets translated delivered really means betrayed. I'm going to be betrayed and given to the Gentiles. Because again, they want him dead. And the Jews couldn't kill him, but if they could get the Romans to crucify him and kill him, then that would take care of the problem for them. So he is betrayed by his own people, by the Jews, given up to the Romans who would fulfill the scripture of the Old Testament and kill him and crucify him. But before they can kill him and crucify him, he's going to be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on. Well, you know, hey, he's humiliated. You know, well, that's, that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal, especially to a Jew, to be humiliated in front of his kinsmen, the one who's coming for them, and yet they're going to reject him and spit on him and, and, and put a blindfold on his face and slap him in the face and say, hey, tell me who he is if you're so good. Tell me who he is that's slapping you. And all the stuff that he's going to go through humiliation-wise, but then physically, the pain-wise, verse 33, they'll scourge him. I want to remind you of what a scourging was. If you've seen a uh, Passion of the Christ, then you've seen a, a Hollywood depiction of it, but that can't do it justice. 
where they take you and they strap you to a pole and then several men take a device that is basically leather strips off the end of it and on the end of those strips you had bone, metal, sharp pieces of rock, glass tied to it and they would whip you with that cat of nine tails. And as they would whip, they would hit you so hard that those pieces of metal and, and glass and bone would dig into your skin and they'd snatch it back, hoping to rip chunks off of you. Yeah. And for 39 lashes, you would take that beating until there was no skin left on your back, till your spine was showing and your ribs were showing and blood was rolling out in the street and everybody knew that you had been scourged. We well, hear that we should read that word scourge there. First, we just go right on by. Maybe not. We tried to do this past uh, Easter. I want you to just stop for a second and see it. Stop for a second and put in your mind the physical pain and suffering. And you know, every time it gets mentioned in the Bible, it doesn't say suffering. It says sufferings more than one. The sufferings of Jesus Christ for us. We're supposed to be on that post, right. taking that with us. Not right. him. That's right. But he took it for us. I love for us. Right. And out of the mercy and grace of a loving God, he took our place on that post. And he got scourged. And then it says simply in the text, and put him to death. Right. I'll remind you. They didn't <laughs> lay him on a gurney and give him a shot. And he closed his eyes and go to sleep. He was crucified. A combination of humiliation and suffering. The worst, most painful death any human being could go through. As they laid him on that cross and drove nails through his hands and one nail through both feet as they sat upon each other with just enough bend in his legs to just make it even more painful because the one reflex you would have as you hung on that cross and lost your ability to breathe would be to push up on those nails and straighten your body up and get another gasp of air. Yeah. And as he hung on that for hours, enduring the pain of the death of crucifixion, I don't want you to just run by that verse and see, oh, they put him to death. They put him to death. And well, he just closed his eyes and he died. He went through the worst, most painful thing any human being could ever go through. And again, he did it sinless, without spot, without blemish. The innocent shedding his blood for the sinful. Just like that animal in Genesis 3, just like that lamb for the Passover, he would be, as John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The ultimate substitute and sacrifice without spot, without blemish, without sin for us sinners. But you know what? If we're going to stop and not just roll over if we're going to stop and, and really think about it. We're going to look at the scourge and we're going to look at the death. Thank God we can stop for just a moment and think about the third day. Amen. Amen. And the third day he shall rise again. Oh, preachers, it'd be a good Easter man. I agree with you. I wish they timed it up that way. But you know what? Uh, it timed up to be on the fourth Sunday in June of 2022. You know what? That's just fine too. Amen. Amen. On the third day he rose again, and the death that the devil thought he had tied him to, the, the victory that the devil thought he had finally won, Jesus came out victorious. Out of a grave, leaving that grave empty, never to be filled with the body of Jesus again. The only one to ever rise from the dead and never die again. Ensuring that those who would place their faith in him and accept what he did on the cross for us, ensuring that we one day would be able to raise into everlasting life. Well, we have the, the good fortune of 
2,000 years of history since then, being able to look back, being able to read about it, having placed our faith in him, because you're not saved if you don't have faith that he died and rose again, you ain't been saved. I ain't tell you that, but right. if you don't believe that, then right. you've never been saved. Right. But we have the opportunity. It's happened. It's history. It's taken place. Disciples don't have that. Verse 34 of the text tells us, and they understood none of those things. Right. If that doesn't hit home, Luke tells us a second way. And this saying was hid from them. And if that's not enough, Luke gives us a third. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. They didn't understand it. They just didn't get it. And they would continue not to get it. How could they not get it? If he tells them this. And this is not the first time he's told them. But he tells them straight up. We're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to raise again on the third day. How much more plain can it be? But they don't get it. They don't understand it. You know why they don't get it? They don't understand it? Because they're just like me and you. They have their own way of thinking about things and they don't want to hear anybody else's way. They don't see the Messiah, the coming King of the Jews, as being killed and crucified. They're looking for the victorious King. They're looking for the victorious kingdom. They're looking for getting out from under Roman rule. They're looking for Jesus ruling the world, and they get their spots. Where's my spot? Lord, hey, they've already argued. Can I be at your right hand? Can I be at your left hand? Their idea of what's coming has nothing at all in common with what's really going to happen. They don't understand that Jesus is really going to die. They don't know exactly what he's going to go through. They have no idea how they're going to leave him in shame and run out of being afraid for their lives. But that's just not what they want to hear. It's not what they want to believe. So they just ignore it. We're no different. When it's not what we want, when it's not how we think, we throw it away. We don't even think about it. Because we have our ideas. What we, what we think is going to happen. How it's going to be. The disciples are no different. But amen again. We have the luxury of it's happened. We look back on it. If you've been saved, you understand it. You believe this account. Right. And you've placed your faith in Jesus because of what he did on the cross. Right. And because of his raising again on the yeah. third day. But these poor old dumb disciples... They just don't get it. Yeah. Hey, if me and you were in that spot, we probably wouldn't have got it right. either. Wow. But guess what? That's still all part of God's perfect plan. It's not a surprise that they didn't understand it and they didn't get it. It's not a surprise that they aren't going to be there, that they're going to all have ran and gotten out of there. It's no surprise. Jesus knows it's all coming. But he's still laying it out there. He's still giving it to them. And thank God that in spite of their not understanding, it didn't keep him from finishing what he came to do. Yeah. We know he finished it because he said so right. on the cross. Right. It is finished. Yeah. And because he finished it, we get to come here today. We sing. We praise the Lord. We have a whole week last week of talking about the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, the only propitiation for sin, the only perfect sacrifice. We get to shower our kids with that. We get to shower ourselves with that, our adults with that, everybody that had a hand in it. And we come this morning. We come to worship. We come to celebrate the only way to God. His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes. And though those 12 don't quite understand it, there's no reason today that anybody sitting in here should be able to leave and not understand it. Yes.
He's made it perfectly clear. And I'm thankful this morning that Jesus Christ is the perfect <clears throat> sacrifice and the only way to be saved. Amen? Amen. If you're a Christian today, you take heart in that. You worship Him because of that. If you're a Christian today, you sit here, you know what we had last week, you rejoice over that. If you're a Christian today, you know what happened with our country this past Friday, and you Amen. rejoice over answered prayers. Amen. If you're a Christian today, because of what Jesus did, amen, you can rejoice and walk out of this church victorious, amen. Thank God, as we got Brandon Dyer coming, as Larry Dyer would say, thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's stand. Wild Denise comes with a verse of invitation. <laughs> Open the altar up this morning. Lord, deal with you. Holy Spirit's working on you this morning. You'd like to come pray. I'd love to pray with you while we sing a verse of song. Page page in the paper file.